Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Ayman and um, I work at Google on uh, everything related to uh, web performance uh, and web technologies. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about how you can be building faster uh, web apps by basically demystifying some of the concepts around web performance and also touching a bit on service workers and how we can basically combine uh, different techniques uh, in both of those um, areas uh, to build better better web apps. Um, while I'm basically uh, going through the presentation, please do. Um, please do. Uh, and whoever wants to also uh, ask their questions and get the answers in English, also I'm happy to do so. Um, so yeah. Uh, but uh, mostly it's going to be in English, uh, but in some sections I'm happy to highlight them more in Arabic if uh, anyone uh, would like that. So uh, with that, um, I guess uh, we can uh, get started. So uh, basically on, on, on the agenda overall, uh, what we're going to be covering is like the basics. Uh, and the prerequisites of uh, the concepts, the measurement uh, techniques, and uh, the tools to analyze web, web performance. Uh, second, we're going to jump into a prioritized list of optimizations that we would usually recommend and are, in my experience, um, are the most kind of uh, important ones that I see when auditing certain web apps or websites or when working on optimization projects. And finally, we're going to work, talk about uh, speeding up with service workers. Basically, if you have a web app uh, that you are um, running and you want to keep it fast after the first page load or for, you know, recurring users, this is where service workers it could be like super, super useful. Um, so with that, um, let's start with understanding the essential concepts for, for, for speed, for understanding speed. So for example, so far, for like maybe if you've been watching the web.dev uh, videos and all of these things, uh, there is a lot of kind of maybe advanced topics or topics uh, that might be too fast forward uh, for many people. So I'm going to start with like the very, very basics of web performance. And by introducing this world of web performance and how, how things work and what are the main metrics that are needed to get started. So. The first important concept to keep in mind is that loading is not a single moment in time. It's actually a journey. So the moment you actually write something in, in your browser's uh, search bar for, for, for accessing a specific site uh, to, uh, and, and right after you click go or whatever button it is to actually, you know, start the, start the um, uh, rendering of the page, there's a whole journey that happens uh, while rendering the page while from the first request that goes to the server down to the last request that comes back to the page, to the rendering, all of these things is actually a journey. For fast sites, you might see like, it's actually like a super fast snap. It's, uh, you know, super snappy. But um, I mean, in, in reality, there's a lot of stuff that goes, uh, that goes, uh, that goes in the, on there. So, uh, so yeah, so let's, let's take a look. Um, first thing also to keep in mind, other than the fact that it's a journey, there's always like the, the, the difference between perception of speed and the actual speed of a page. And perception of speed, there's lots of tricks you can be doing uh, from a user experience perspective to improve the perception of a user, of how a user sees the page being loaded. And that's also part of this whole web performance world. But at the same time, there's also the actual metrics related to how the page is loading. Um, today, we will be more focusing on the metrics, on the actual performance of a page and uh, the different techniques uh, that you could be using to improve the performance of that page. And, and the journey I was talking about of, of loading a page basically is, um, is, is dependent on many events that actually happen and get fired um, in, in your browser while um, it's, actually, it's actually loading and rendering the page. So, for example, um, there are two metrics uh, to keep in mind, like the start render and the first contentful paint, for example. Those two metrics uh, measure 
whether the actual you know rendering or the actual page is actually loading or uh, or uh, or actually starting to to happen like this this those two metrics metrics would answer this question for example then uh, basically there's the speed index uh, speed index would actually try to tell us like okay is the page actually useful is what i'm seeing on the screen like but by that time is, is am i seeing something useful on the screen this is what the speed index would measure as a metric and then there's for example the time to interactive which basically answers the question is the page useful by now like is it actually usable uh, and what we mean by usable is that a user can actually click um uh you can you can actually click and 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 interact with the page whether it's a couple of drop downs uh clicking on the search bar clicking buttons getting feedback and this is what we call the time to interactive and the thing is all of those metrics are are um are highly dependent on how you build your page how you build your front end and how you prioritize the resources being um, loaded um, on on the uh, in in the site and uh, loaded on the screen. Um, and today, basically, we're going to be talking about different techniques to optimize against those metrics. Another important concept uh, to keep in mind is uh, that there's always a difference in terms of data when you measure uh, when you measure the performance of a web page. So the first uh, the first area is called field data, and the second area we call it the uh, actually this should be lab data. Sorry, so it's lab data versus sorry lab data versus field data. Um, yeah, actually let me update it here. Yeah. So yeah, so that's what that's what we call lab data. Uh, lab data is everything we can simulate. Um, what we say simulate is actually run on our own as if we're simulating a specific user session. So there are different tools. There's the, the totally different category of tools specifically for lab data. And then uh, there is uh, a totally different category of tools uh, for uh, things related to field data, data that actually users are experiencing, how the users are actually experiencing our site. Um, so uh, going back to those two different uh, areas of uh, data of how we basically differentiate between the two types of data, uh, under lab data, we can different tools like Lighthouse, uh, Web Page Test, uh, Chrome DevTools, while uh, field data, we have things like Chrome UX Report or uh, data that is coming through Google Analytics or Firebase, which is actual data that our users are experiencing as they actually open up the pages. Or, for example, some data from Google Ads, uh, like the landing page speed score. This is data that's actually recorded and stored there. And then you can access through reports and all of these things. And uh, <clears throat> to get an even better picture of, of the whole ecosystem of, um, of you know, web performance uh, tooling, um, I put, put, this, uh, put this chart um, here to actually give you a visualization of that. So when we look, for example, at a tool like Lighthouse, and a tool like Lighthouse, for example, is all about you know uh, lab data. This, at the same time, this this lab this this Lighthouse is not just a tool on its own that you would you know fire up on Chrome, but it also serves as an engine uh, that can be you know uh, reused as a library in other services. It could be used as a CLI tool. It could be used uh, in other services like Web Page Test which basically runs uh, synthetic or simulated tests on top of Lighthouse, but basically simulates additional devices, simulates uh, different locations, and all of these, uh, and all of these things. Um, at the same time, there is the uh, Chrome UX report, which is basically fed from data that comes from the Chrome usage stati statistics of actual users who uh, basically are opted into uh, usage statistics on mobile and desktop and all of these things. And then this data gets collected and stored in BigQuery and is available for everyone to actually use at Query. Um, and then there's other tools that we basically build on top. Uh, there are different tools like, you know, PageSpeed Insights, where, for example, PageSpeed Insights actually manages to uh, combine the, the best of both worlds. Like it combines Chrome UX data of actual users, but at the same time, it helps you do uh, synthetic tests based on Lighthouse. So all of these tools have different, uh, you know, use cases. 
Um, and if uh, if you have more questions about those, I'm happy to answer the use cases of those. Uh, feel free to put them in in, in the uh, in the comments. Um, for today, um, I will focus on lab metrics specifically, and I will focus on uh, basically giving you now a summary on on the lab kind of data tools that you could be uh, could could be doing. This is uh, obviously easier to start with. Um, it, it is as easy, basically, as running a lighthouse, uh, a lighthouse test uh, in, in Chrome DevTools. If you open Chrome DevTools, there's a lighthouse tab, and you can actually do an audit there for, for your site. Um, why those are useful, why those metrics are useful is because basically, um, uh, basically, you know, they're consistent um, and they are within a controlled environment. So you can actually control, you know, which devices you want to be testing on, uh, which networks, which, you know, maybe you want to test them from a specific server sitting in a specific location, you could do that. Um, this is one of the um, one of the benefits of that. Also, you can, you know, run them as much as you want, which means you could run those metrics maybe as part of, you know, a test, uh, a test suite and then integrate it in your CI, CD or, uh, whatever other um, thing you want. So the first tool uh, of those tools that provide lab data is uh, Lighthouse, which is available on Chrome. And it's, it's pretty much the most, uh, you know, uh, common way of measuring um, measuring site performance. It runs locally um, and you can just run it and test things out quickly. And it can provide you with a very like, you know, high level kind of view of the different uh, you know areas and metrics you could be improving the performance on um, and at the same time it can give you also some action uh, action items of what you could be doing through the opportunities like it would highlight say for example yeah you have to resize the images you have to maybe compress your javascript or uh, things like that or we're going to also go over more details of, of that such an analysis then there's page speed insights which is um, basically a way to provide you know high level consistent test runs that are uh, basically running on uh, on they're they're actually running server side um, and also at the same time it helps you you know combine data coming from chrome ux reports which is uh, field data uh, so you combine that with with lab data so that's uh, another one uh, a third one which is one of the really uh, important tools out there in the web performance uh, world is web page test and uh, what web page test, test does is basically it's um, it's basically a tool built on top of a lighthouse uh, where basically it, it runs multiple instances of lighthouse uh, in different scenarios. So it can run them, you know, it can simulate lighthouse, lighthouse on more, you know, devices. It can simulate lighthouse on more servers, more locations, uh, different network connections like 3G, 4G. All of these things can be done on web page test. And they have basically their own kind of um, reporting to um, support that. Um, also, another great thing about a web page test is in the results, it can give you a very nice um, waterfall kind of visualization uh, when you run a test through uh, a web page test. And this waterfall is actually critical for visualizing and understanding how the performance of your site is happening as it is rendering. So we talked about this, you know, overall journey around rendering and, and how things work uh, there. Uh, this basically gives you like a better drill down on, you know, how, uh, how your site is performing as it is getting rendered and which resources are consuming the most. So for example, you can see here, uh, let's say the main document, let's say is taking that much time. At the same time, the rest of the resources are actually dependent on it. So until the main document actually has loaded, uh, the rest of the, doc uh, the the rest of the resources are not loading yet. So it's something to keep in mind. And this is how you would basically analyze such a waterfall uh, kind of setup. So that is, in a nutshell, the um, the devices. Uh, so, sorry, the uh, the uh, the metrics and the tools uh, that you can use, like basically, basically that you can as actually use today. Um, that have like basically the, the, the least uh, amount of complexity to get started with. Um, before we go into the three main areas that I wanted to cover today for uh, for for becoming faster, 
and I'll, I'll be also highlighting some some results from those tools I discussed. Um, do you have any questions, whether in English or Arabic? Please um, feel free to um, to ask them now. Okay, so um, I guess I'll, I'll move forward with the, with the second section. And if you if you have questions in the meantime, please feel free to put them uh, uh, on the on the live comments, whether Arabic or English. Happy happy to answer. Um, then uh, the next section here is uh, basically uh, on how to become faster. Um, and in this section, I'm going to highlight only three topics of so many other topics that you could actually get into for improving the performance, or actually at least consider. So the three main topics I'm gonna highlight today is basically optimizing JavaScript, optimizing images, and optimizing third-party tags. And in my experience, those are like the most heavy uh, kind of areas, and, and actually one, like probably the most, the most important ones. Um, and so before we start, uh, usually the general principles here uh, when optimizing anything is basically, uh, we call them the three R's, remove, reduce, and reuse. When we say remove is that if you don't want, like if you have resources uh, that uh, your code base is actually, you know, including or adding to the page and things like that, you might not need this stuff. So it's good to actually do a review of whether the stuff in your code base, the stuff you're including, the stuff you're bundling in your JavaScript, uh, or the images you're adding, do you really need them? That would be the first question to ask. Uh, the second question to ask uh, is to reduce. Like, could I actually reduce um, the size of my JavaScript bundles? Could I be removing certain code to improve the efficiency? So the more we reduce, the more we uh, decrease the size of our files from a code perspective, not just from a zip, uh, zipping perspective, because there's a difference. Uh, so for example, if you only compress, uh, that's, that's not really enough because also we want to reduce the amount of code being delivered to the browser. And this is critical because when you, when you, when you deliver, um, a certain amount of code to the browser, the browser still has to, you know, evaluate that code. It has to run it. It has to, uh, actually execute it also. In, like basically run it as an executed in, in the browser. So this is something very, very important. And the less code you actually deliver to the browser, uh, the better, uh, the, the more you reduce the CPU load overall and the better the, pay, the first page load for a user will be. Um, and finally, reusing. And that's, that's another concept um, that you should keep in mind, uh, which is basically uh, mostly around caching. Like if you are using a resource, you should, probably reuse it if you need it on other pages. And we will definitely go over this concept and uh, how to apply it in different um, areas. So the first um, the first area here is optimizing images. And uh, based on some statistics in the HTTP archive, 49% of a uh, page load, uh, like a media, 49% on average of, of, a, of a, a page load uh, in terms of resources are actually um, images um, and basically optimizing the images obviously would mean it would have a big impact on your overall page load so let's jump and see what we can optimize so the first the first rule around optimizing images is try to just if you don't need the images uh, certain images on a web page try simply just to remove them or try to replace them with css so at many points in time, for example, you might want to have maybe gradients or border radius or box shadow. All of these things are now, you know, supported natively uh, through CSS uh, in the browser. There is no need to have images, for example, to do these kind of things. So that would be the first one uh, to actually try to eliminate and try to replace them with CSS, which basically is much lighter and gets evaluated uh, faster in the browser uh, and painted uh, in, a, in a much more efficient way. So 
the second um the second um the uh the, the, sec the second uh, the second option here would be to leverage caching and here when i'm saying caching uh server side caching as in basically making sure you know um that that the images you're you're using in your web page um are actually cached uh, especially if you need them multiple times uh, maybe have a long term kind of expiration date from your server so you don't have to actually request them multiple times so this would actually help you in reducing the number of requests from from the client uh, to the server and that would be the first kind of level of caching um, yeah and uh, another another uh, area to look into is uh, that not all images have the same priority so when working with a web page, especially if uh, being displayed on mobile or most of your users are going to be on mobile web, which is where most of the optimization actually uh, would be targeting here. Uh, uh, basically, you can uh, you can pretty much uh, you know try to actually provide uh, priority like prioritization on 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 your on your web page uh, of, of different images. So uh, one technique would be actually to prioritize the images that are above the fold. Above the fold, what we mean is that if you have a screen, right, such as this one, the images that are meant to show uh, up uh, in the image, like above the fold in a mobile phone, you would actually preload those images. And by preloading those images, basically, you are giving them priority to be loaded uh, before the rest of uh, the images. And that would actually allow them to load faster, while the rest of the images basically would take their time and would be basically, um, yeah, they, they would be basically deprioritized. De de How preloading works? Uh, preloading it is pretty pretty simple. Like adding a preload is as simple as basically mentioning uh, rel equal preload uh, in a link tag in your header. So if you have specific images you want to re preload that are very critical to, to your web page. Uh, that would be one of the ways to do it. For example, this is especially true for, let's say, headers that are common across multiple uh, pages or even in one page, but you really want to, you know, keep it uh, super priority. Same thing for the for the logo, for example, uh, and these kind of things. Preloading um, is your friend there. Um, also, at the same time, you could be uh, improving your preloading because basically you might not need to, you know, you, you might not want to preload everything and on every single screen, right? Because you have screens that could span, you know, different, uh, like could be of different sizes and the, your web page would be showing in different ways, which means every, the stuff above the fold of the screen uh, on screen A might be different on, from screen B. And here basically you could be adding, you know, conditions based on uh, media queries to uh, specify under which media query to preload which image. So that, that's also um, another option. Um, another also uh, technique that is widely used is uh, using SVG for icons, obviously, um, especially icons uh, and images that are geometric in shape. Uh, it's much, much more you know, uh, efficient to actually load those. Uh, they're much lighter to download and load them and render them uh, by the browser versus uh, traditional images. Another also uh, technique you could be looking at, probably not for everything, obviously, but maybe for, for some critical images, you could be using, you know, uh, base 64 encoding so that you can probably, you know, cut on uh, certain network requests, like you don't have to do a network request for it. It would be in the browser directly uh, added into the SRC of the image as a base 64. So that's also another, um, another option. Uh, yeah. Um, another thing to uh, keep in mind and the question to ask is, do I have to load all my images right away? So basically, first of all, we talked about prioritization. Fine, say we prioritize, let's say, three images or four images in a specific web page. Uh, the other question here is, do we really need to uh, do do we really need to load everything? Um, and the, uh, the 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 answer is no, not really. Um, and the more elaborate answer is basically lazy loading. And what we mean by lazy loading is basically we are basically only loading whatever the user is actually seeing versus um, everything else that the user is not seeing. And this can be super efficient uh, for many different reasons. 
it's basically less network requests as soon as the page loads. Um, we're doing only the network requests that uh, the user is actually re related to what the user is actually seeing by basically only loading the images that are above the fold or the images that are now in the scrolling view of, of the user. Um, it can, on, on mobile phones, this, this can help you like reduce overall battery consumption since you're doing less requests, you're doing less processing, um, you're, re you're reducing data consumption for users and you're improving the overall download speed um, of, of the whole, basically the whole experience of the user while they're actually loading the page. Um, one thing to consider when lazy loading uh, or when applying uh, lazy, lazy loading is that to actually use the right libraries and uh, use the right techniques for doing that and making sure not to lazy load everything, right? Especially if you're using a JavaScript library to do the to do the lazy loading, for example, or maybe a custom one, you wouldn't want to, you know, lazy load uh, whatever is above the fold because then you'd, you'd be actually, you know, adding additional additional work uh, that you might not actually uh, need to do. Um, one quick win on on lazy loading is that now this is being supported more and more natively in browsers, which is fantastic. Um, and by simply adding uh, an attribute to the image, which uh, says loading equal lazy. Uh, the same actually applies for iframes too. So basically you don't really need to add a third party library or a uh, or additional scripts or to write certain logic on scroll and these kind of things. You can just, you know, use the uh, native image lazy loading um, option. So yeah, this is mainly just, you know, illustrating the difference between eager loading and lazy loading, pretty much what we talked about. If you notice like on, on the right, uh, you're downloading less and you're only downloading based on demand from the user while, you know, while with eager loading, you're actually downloading everything, which is not really uh, super efficient. Uh, same thing applies for iframes, uh, especially now that this feature actually, uh, you know, supports um, iframes. Um, if you really need JavaScript libraries to actually do the lazy loading, there are some cases where you might need that. Uh, for example, you know, if you want to support more browsers that don't really support this natively yet, um, or maybe you have some advanced use cases where you absolutely need to apply it to JavaScript, you can always do that. Um, one thing to keep in mind, super important is in the past, lazy loading libraries used to use, you know, uh, on scroll kind of events in JavaScript to try to detect when the um, when the resource uh, is actually within the uh, user's uh, viewing. Uh, now uh, this has been uh, like the, the the trend these days is basically more to rely on op intersection observer API, which can uh, detect when the user is actually seeing uh, those items in a much more efficient way instead of relying on, on scrolling events. Uh, yeah, and uh, this, uh, like the, the overall recommendation is try to use libraries that actually use that API over, you know, the traditional way of, of doing um, lazy loading. So that's just, just one, uh, one, of, uh, one of them. Uh, lazy size is actually one of them uh, for you to check and there's uh, a bunch of others. Uh, you could also implement your own if you really want to have like a fallback and like, let's say you want to implement, you know, native lazy loading, but then uh, you just want a fallback in case the browser doesn't support it. That's also pretty easy to do these days. You could, you know, by default load your um, lo load your image uh, by the like by by uh, basically add your image and you add uh, lazy, uh, loading equal lazy attribute on that image. This will work uh, out of the box on browsers that support it. And then um, you can add a simple script out there just to check if the browser actually, you know, um, supports uh, the the uh, native lazy loading or not. If it doesn't, then basically you would just um, do the lazy loading uh, yourself uh, in JavaScript. So that would be one of the uh, ways to do uh, both together. Any any questions so far? Okay. Um, if you have any questions while I'm I'm talking about 
the the rest of the sections feel free to uh to to jump in and and uh share with me on the um on the live comments please so the second section will be uh, optimizing javascript and so this is basically the second largest kind of uh, area that we look at uh, when it comes to performance optimization um, the first thing when you're doing an audit, um, if you, let's say, ran web page test as a tool, uh, one great way to understand, uh, the, uh, amount of, uh, the amount of, the amount of, of, uh, actually we have a question by, uh, Layal. I'll, I'll actually answer that first. Um, are there certain criteria that you look for when choosing a JS library? Um, well, uh, that's actually a very good question. Um, when when choosing a JS library, um, in terms of criteria, first it depends on the library. I'd say, um, I guess you're uh, if if you're referring for for example for for uh, libraries for lazy loading, for example, I would look 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 at you know trying to support native um, kind of functionality, uh, as we mentioned, like intersection observer API. Um, if it's something else, uh, yes, usually like trying to trying to find libraries that um, have a that are actually a fallback to a native natively supported uh, API in, in the browsers would be actually a good idea. So, for example, you know, uh, li like for example, for when 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 doing lazy loading, right? Trying to find something uh, that actually is mostly supported natively, but then the JavaScript library is providing a fallback for. That would be uh, one. If we're talking more around, you know, frameworks and things like that, it becomes a, a bit more tricky. Uh, if if you'd like to explain more, actually, um, what uh, what kind of libraries we, we're looking at here, um, I think I'd be able to 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 help and answer your question um, uh, better, I guess. So uh, yeah, if you, if you'd like to share more details on that specific example, happy happy to do that. Uh, happy to answer. Uh, in the meantime, I'll I'll continue with the uh, rest of the presentation uh, around auditing JavaScript. So uh, basically, when when trying to analyze our JavaScript, uh, what one way to do it, uh, or let's say you have a website, right? You want to try to see what is the percentage of resources mostly. Uh, actually most mostly present in, in your web page uh, web page test provides a very nice report uh, in one of the tabs in the results after running a specific test uh, which is basically around showing the mime types uh, that would be uh, that, that are actually in your web page and from there you can start getting a hint on how much javascript there is so for example in this test which is a sample test i run javascript is taking 31.4 percent of the size uh, size of the page um, and the rest mostly is images, right? Which is why, you know, we looked at image optimization and now we're looking also at JavaScript optimization because those are kind of the most common resources and the resources that are most prone to uh, performance uh, problems. Um, also when auditing, if, if you're running an audit with Lighthouse, for example, as I mentioned previously, there are certain recommendations also, there are, there are certain highlights that um, uh, there are certain highlights for uh, you know uh, for for uh, checking the uh, that that would highlight certain certain problems such as for example the weight of JS libraries out there uh, that are in your page. So for example, this is a sample report showing like you know the um, the top um, yeah, the, the top resources that are being consumed uh, that are being loaded. The total CPU time they are cons consuming, the total amount of script evaluation that is happening, and the total amount of script parsing. Those three, um, those three uh, metrics, I'd say, for any script are super important to keep in mind. Uh, which, again, um, uh, as as I said said in the beginning, um, it's not just about the size of the file you're downloading as a piece of JavaScript, but also the code itself like how much time it's actually taking to evaluate that script, how much time it's taking to parse it, and how much time it is actually executing in terms of uh, execution. Uh, and that would all basically account to the CPU time of your script. And that can actually, you know, 
uh, highly affect one of the one of the metrics that are super important that I talked about in the beginning, which is the time to interactive, uh, because it can delay a lot of things. It can delay the rendering of the page, it can delay the rendering of other resources, and it can delay uh, the time by which a user is actually able to interact with a page. So uh, yeah. Another way to uh, look at your JavaScript uh, and how, how it's running is basically by checking the performance in the Chrome uh, DevTools under uh, Performance tab. So in the, in the Performance tab, you can actually run a, uh, a test of a specific load or a specific interaction happening on a web page. And then it will give you basically uh, a waterfall kind of timeline of how things are, you know, loading, uh, how dependent are they to each other, what are the resources, and all of that. Usually, uh, everything in yellow is basically JavaScript. So in this case, for example, if you if you notice, like JavaScript is pretty taking a lot of time. Uh, the script is actually taking a lot of time to run. Um, it's running while other resources are doing other things. But at the same time, it would be usually a good, you know, um, uh, opportunity to check uh, and try to inspect like why is this happening? Why is the script running for that many uh, milliseconds? Um, now, a quick way to actually try to, you know, um, maybe if, if you have certain scripts in the page um, that you want to, you know, you know you don't really want to run the first thing, uh, the, the first thing as soon as the page loads, uh, as, as the page is loading, you can definitely use uh, async and defer uh, attributes. Uh, and here, basically, the idea those attributes are meant to prevent the a piece of JavaScript from actually blocking uh, uh, the execution or the fetching of other scripts uh, or other resources in the page. Because the idea here, you want to actually get a page showing up, uh, showing up to the user as soon as possible as the user is actually viewing the page while not actually obstructing the rest of the resources. And this is exactly what async and defer are for. So uh, by using async, for example, the uh, the, uh, the the script uh, the script the, the script the script fetching and execution shouldn't actually wouldn't be basically you know uh, interfering with the rest of the resources uh, while the HTML is being uh, parsed. Well, on async, it's more on the fetching. So while while the script is being fetched, it's not gonna obstruct the rest of the uh, HTML from uh, being parsed uh, or from other resources from being uh, from being parsed. Uh, while if you use defer, it will actually uh, also download the script uh, asynchronously, but at the same time it would delay its execution till the end because when the script is gonna de was is gonna be executed at some point, it will potentially be blocking the rest of the page uh, from from rendering or or getting its stuff done. So defer would make sure the actual download is asynchronous and at the same time, the execution happens at the very, very end um, of, uh, of, of, the, of the page load journey. So, so that um, is something also to um, consider. Um, another best practice when it comes to JavaScript is uh, basically um, keeping your JS payloads at a minimum. So uh, by, by, by first, first step is here to, to run a uh, bundle analyzer. Basically, if you, let's say, are using Webpack, there is a plugin called uh, the Webpack Bundle Analyzer, which can analyze <coughs> the uh, size of the scripts that, are just been, uh, that have just been basically generated by your, uh, by your build tool. And then it can give you a nice visualization to see what are the biggest files out there being generated for you to get an idea on that. So that's basically the, one of the first steps to analyze, uh, uh, to analyze the, uh, you know, uh, to analyze the overall uh, script size. Um, another important technique um, that is used a lot is also uh, removing uh, unused code through tree shaking. Uh, what we mean by tree shaking, it's actually a technique that the build tools uh, could uh, potentially do uh, on their own. Uh, build tools such as Webpack, Rollup, Parcel. Uh, but at the same time, the code, th there needs to be some prerequisites happening in the code, such as, for example, you know, uh, the ES syntax uh, for import-export is, is there. 
um, and you, you know properly properly including the dependencies. So uh, that's also a concept to look at. Uh, I would suggest following this link to to learn more later on. That is a topic by its own, honestly. So um, I'll just move forward a bit faster. Um, also, splitting the bundles is something very very important to do. Uh, tools like uh, tools like Webpack sh should be able to do that too, pretty uh, pretty easily. Also, depending on how you structure your project um, and uh, all of that. Another another pattern, uh, another thing, uh, also uh, what we call the purple pattern, uh, basically, uh, which is which is all around uh, basically uh, combining all of these kind of concepts uh, we talked about. So one base by by assessing the bundle size, uh, making sure the bundles are actually small or actually are of a specific size, then splitting those bundles into chunks uh, and probably prioritizing the initial route or uh, prioritizing specific resources that are absolutely needed for a specific page, um, using async and defer for prioritizing those scripts and prioritizing you know, the rendering of, of the HTML and other resources of the page over, over JavaScript. And uh, finally, using pre-caching techniques, uh, uh, using service workers, for example, which uh, we can we can talk about later, depending on on the time. Uh, finally, another technique uh, that could be super uh, useful is adaptive serving. So, in some, in, in many, in many browsers, um, uh, Chrome Chrome is one of them. You could actually be accessing the Navigator API, and through that Navigator API, you could be checking the actual connection that a user is on dynamically on the client side, and this is actually super useful because you could actually on uh, you could detect if a user is on a 3G, a 3G network or a 4G network or a Wi-Fi. And for example, if let's say you have a, a web app uh, that is you know showing video, right, has a custom video player, and you have a custom video player component, and you know you want to actually load the right video. Uh, in terms of size, based on the network of the user, automatically, this would be one of the uh, APIs to check. So uh, navigator uh, dot connection is basically how you could um, how you could check the uh, check the network connection, and based on that, you adapt the serving of the page. So uh, as I said, in terms of JS solutions, uh, you can think of it like in terms of summary. We only want to send code that users actually need. We want to avoid large uh, JavaScript files. We want to uh, basically return small JS bundles that are probably scoped towards specific features or specific components that can be dynamically loaded or maybe cached uh, or maybe loaded later uh, during the page load. So all of these things uh, would help uh, towards that. Applying techniques like tree shaking to actually remove unused code uh, from the uh, final bundle that gets shipped uh, on on the on the web app. So all of these are, are like super important to to keep in mind. Finally, uh, the third uh, topic I want to talk about in terms of optimization is third party tags. And third party tags is actually a very very tricky subject, by the way. Um, it's not easy to to uh, optimize code uh, that you are actually embedding while you're not really the author of that code. This is one of the hardest things to optimize and one of the trickiest, and it can account to a lot of um, performance problems in a page, um, especially as you add more tags. Uh, so first thing, how do you know um, how much third-party tags are, are on your site or on your web app? Um, one way to do it is uh, through uh, Lighthouse. Lighthouse also now in a report, when generating a Lighthouse report, it could potentially highlight, you know, uh, the impact of third-party code on your um, in your in your website or a web page. So that would be the first way to actually detect the amount of uh, third-party tags and their impact on the web page overall. Um, the second, uh, the, the second thing uh, you could check also on uh, if you're running a web page test uh, tool uh, uh, report would be to check the domains. So it can give you basically a um, breakdown of the number of domains that your web page is actually trying to access, uh, and the number of third-party domains that are being accessed. Right. So basically, based on analyzing those requests, you can know okay. These requests are going to a third party versus these requests are actually going to uh, my server, so or my CDN, for example. So this is something also to 
to keep in mind. And it's actually a very nice way to understand third party versus non third third party uh, code that's being uh, executed on on the web page. Also, another thing on web page test they can do uh, based on that report, they can also generate like a graph kind of structure showing uh, the relationship of uh, the requests and the mapping of those requests and where they're going. So that's also a very nice visualization to check um, in the report uh, to keep in mind, which is pretty much basically a summary of, of this one, but you know, a bit more uh, visual uh, to, to check out. Um, finally, also in the web page test waterfall, when analyzing a specific waterfall, for example, you can see uh, basically the URL here, and then you can see the execution and uh, the uh, the time it's taking to actually fetch that and execute it and run it and evaluate it as a resource and its dependency on other resources and what resources are depending on it. And those resources could be third-party tags. So um, a great way to see hints about the, the performance of third-party third tags and how they're affecting your overall performance um, can be through the web page test uh, waterfall details page. Um, to actually assess, uh, so, 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 so there's a very nice way to actually try to assess or A-B test, you know, the effect of third party tags on your, uh, on, on your page is basically by extracting those domains that you, uh, got in the first place from the web page test, uh, uh, report around the domains that are being accessed. Maybe you want to copy paste a couple of them and then you put them in the script tag, a uh, script tab, basically. Um, and, uh, sorry, and the block tab, it should be in the block tab. Uh, and then basically you can then, you know, block a specific domains or you could maybe in the script tag provide a bit more information about what to block and what not to block. Uh, so that could be one way. And then you would run the test again. And then by blocking those third party domains, you could actually be, uh, and you can actually be then, you know, blocking certain, uh, tags and then seeing the performance of how it looks like. Uh, after blocking those tags, so that would be uh, one of the uh, one of the ways to do it. Um, also, on Chrome DevTools, you could be blocking specific requests. So, for example, uh, when you open the network tab, you could be you know checking which requests are happening. You could block some of them, and then you can rerun a lighthouse test. And in the lighthouse test that you will be rerunning, basically. Uh, what would happen is that uh, it would be blocking those uh, and blocking those would actually provide, you know, a different performance uh, uh, mark or a different performance value. And then this way you would be assessing, you know, whether um, whether uh, third party tags have a huge impact on your website or or a bit less. So that's something to to keep in mind. Now, once you have identified the uh, third party scripts and have gone through the vetting process, and understand all of these things, it's time to actually try to do something about them, right? So the first thing um, we'd recommend usually is going through uh, applying defer and async on third party tags. Um, and here basically the idea is to try to defer as much as possible uh, the tags to actually run in the very, very end to execute and at the same time would be loading asynchronously. So those are techniques to actually uh, apply on third party tags if you don't want to get too deep on the implementation of the third party tags. Um, another way of, of doing it also, uh, well, actually one complementary way of doing it would be uh, doing pre-connect. So pre-connect allows you to pre-connect to the origins of those third party uh, tags uh, or, uh, you know, and that way uh, you could be speeding up the connection and the downloading uh, process of those tags. You could also combine, you know, pre-connect uh, with uh, uh, DNS prefetch uh, so, uh, to, to, to do that, uh, to do that. Um, another option would be also to, uh, additional to that would be to self host third party tags on your own CDN. So, for example, if you're relying on, you know, a, a set of third party tags, maybe if the, um, if, if, if the, if the resource, uh, server is not really maybe that fast or has a, uh, uh has a very low kind of, you know, um, time to first byte, uh, you might want to actually host it on your own CDN. That would be one way to do it. Just keep in mind, you're always hosting an up-to-date version of this tag uh, from the publisher and, you know, it's not out of date um, and these kind of things. Um, you could also, if you want, uh, at some point, 
minify and bundle your third-party tag scripts uh, together with uh, the rest of, of the code you're publishing or maybe, you know, uh, putting them in a couple of bundles specifically, you could do that. I wouldn't say this might have a huge impact, but I mean, that would probably be part of, you know, self-serving uh, your own third-party tags and then putting them also on the CDN. So that's also one option. But I'd say you need a combination of all of those um, tips that I talked about when it comes to uh, third-party tags. Finally, um, up, to, up to now, we've been talking about basically speeding up for a user that, that a first time user ever accessing a web page or, uh, or a website of yours and how you would want to actually, you know, uh, uh, make it performant for a first time user. So now we're going to talk about service workers, uh, which can have different kind of use cases here. Uh, but in this case, we're going to talk about uh, their use case from a web performance perspective. Um, if you have any questions from the previous section, please do ask me. If not, I will get directly into um, service workers. Okay, so um, I'll jump into the service workers uh, topic. Uh, so for basic, basically, as we, as we said initially, um, page loading is a whole journey. Uh, you have a first user, as I mentioned, the optimizations we were talking about were for first view users, a user that is seeing this for the first time in their life. But then basically there's another thing where some users might be doing repeat views, right? They're seeing your, they're seeing your web page over and over again. Maybe they're seeing your main page, but they haven't navigated to the rest of the pages that are very likely to be navigated to. For example, say you're on the home page, but there's a very highly likelihood that they're gonna get on the, you know, about page or contact us page or whatever it is. So this is where um, using, for example, service workers could be very, very useful because you could be caching very uh, critical uh, resources here uh, programmatically in your JavaScript code. So now we're gonna talk more about it. Um, so uh, basically, if you want to compare, you know, uh, first time users versus repeat users in terms of like how the resources are being fetched uh, for the user, uh, there is a small gap here that if you're using, you know, uh, if you're dealing with every user as a first time user every single time, even if they are a repeated user, there's a small gap that is actually underserved, uh, which is basically some resources want to be, you know, uh, reused or maybe some resources want to be cached or pre-cached before a user goes to other pages or maybe, you know, if let's say that you're using an API over and over again, you might want to cache certain pieces of that API as JSON, let's say, through uh, through service workers. Um, if we look at the caching the regular way, like service server side caching, uh, which you always need to have, like HTTP caching, that's definitely a fundamental thing to have always. Um, you notice that it's always like going uh, going back and forth to the server. Um, also, when there's no connection, your resource is not going to be returned at all. While if you're using service workers, the idea is that the service worker is a piece of code that you write and publish in your front end that would sit as a proxy between your uh, browser and the client side and the server. And whatever is actually passing through can be intercepted and can be evaluated and manipulated through the service worker. And then the service worker could interact with the cache API in the browser to uh, add stuff in the cache, remove from the cache, uh, do certain things, uh, and, inter and interact from on, on, on the behalf of the client side with the server uh, for you. So this would be the idea. And the thing is the service worker is scriptable. You can do so many complex logic uh, there around the caching and how you're managing the cache and the caching strategies that you can't really do with traditional HTTP caching. So uh, we're gonna talk about a bit on the caching strategies here. So when we talk about service workers, we talk about caching strategies. And there are different use cases for caching strategies. One, one of the most one of the most popular ones would be basically uh, through the app shell, uh, the app shell model, where, where basically you would you know preload and cache uh, you know the main header, for example, the menu, the app-like features in a web app, especially if it's a single page app, for example. Uh, those would be pretty much cached on the user's browser for a, a relatively longer time. Uh, those would load the first, and then you know you would load the content and the rest of the stuff. 
Uh, and those can be applied through different, you know, uh, caching strategies. So, for example, the upshell could be done through a, you know, uh, a cache fallback to network kind of strategy, which means, you know, serve from cache first. If it's not in the cache, serve from the network, then cache it. So this would be one of the strategies. Uh, another strategy would be for other kind of data that will need to be more real time or more, you know, uh, up to date would be, for example, uh, pricing uh, or timely data and these kind of things, then you would go with a network first strategy. Um, a stuff like that could be a bit kind of late from a from a time perspective that would be okay-ish, like news feeds, messages, product listing, this kind of uh this kind these kind of things. Another thing you can do with service workers is um doing, you know, not just uh so 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 here if, if you notice you actually you know are preloading things that would be needed for uh, for repeat use so that's that's uh, that's the idea so the other thing i want to talk about is prefetching which is super important you could actually be uh, you could actually be you know prefetching uh, specific uh, resources you could be prefetching specific resources that you would need on other pages so you could for example if let's say in the menu you have three items and on the home page you could be uh, writing your service uh, your, your service worker code in a way where you would pre-cache maybe CSS, HTML, JavaScript, uh, maybe even JSON-related resources that you need in the rest of the pages after reaching the first page. Uh, you could actually be caching, pre-caching that so that once the user clicks on, let's say, something in the menu, the page would load super fast uh, and all thanks to service workers. Um, Pretty much, yeah, that's it uh, from uh, from a service worker perspective. One thing to keep in mind is one rest site restructuring. That's something you need to keep in mind. The site structure plays a big, a big, big part. Applying the app shell model is a key to do that kind of strategy. Um, plan for caching strategies and then implement, uh, you know, service workers through a library like Workbox, for example, which makes it super, super easy. Um, Okay, so uh, I guess my time is pretty much up. So uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about. Uh, there are definitely so many other topics to talk about around web performance. Uh, you can always check them on web.dev basically. So uh, thank you very much for your time and it was really uh, nice seeing you all. Have a good night.